All right then, friends, let's begin. Good morning, everyone. Peggy, good morning. Um, but I can, I can ask you please to read. Start, begin our journey. The design of the menorah. Okay, sorry, just one second. The design of the menorah. The shape of the branches of the menorah. The menorah is very frequently employed as a Jewish, Jewish symbol. Nevertheless, the authenticity of the design with which the menorah is usually depicted is a matter of question. For there are several inconsistencies between the designs generally employed and the description of this article in the traditional sources. The branches of the menorah are one of such example. Generally, these branches are depicted as semicircular or oblong in shape. Nevertheless, Rashi in his commentary to the Torah explicitly writes that the branches extend upward in a diagonal. Indeed, the very Hebrew word which the Torah uses to describe the branches, obe? Panim. Hmm? Panim. Panim? Panim, yeah, that's the Hebrew term there, Kanim. Okay, because that's not what it says. Okay, implies a straight line. What do you have? I have a different uh, stuff. What do you have? have O-H-B-E. O H B E. I think that's a default, a default of the Hebrew. I have it written in Hebrew. A default of the Hebrew text somehow um, produced those letters, which mean nothing. O H B E. <laughs> I think it's just a default of the letters. So the Hebrew word kanin is, is a term that's used to describe a reed. A reed. Stalk or a, or a stalk, <clears throat> which is a straight line. Um, that's the term that the Torah uses, that the, the, the branches are described as cunning, implying a straight line. And Rashi says outright that they extend it upward in diagonal. So as you, we all know, I mean, it's changed because since this talk that we are reading now, this is a landmark. Sorry, I had to just mute everybody again. So uh, Peggy, you have to unmute yourself again. Um, so it, this is a landmark talk. It was in the early 80s, I recall. And uh, since then, as we will see at the end of our discussion, Menorah you know, is <clears throat> you know, Yitzi, I said we have to vacuum upstairs. I didn't say the stairs. Because the stairs. Too much information. <laughs> um, again, Pig, you have to unmute yourself when, when you speak. Sorry. Because I, I can't. Uh, well, I guess I can. So since this talk in the early 80s, in Chabad circles and Chabad, uh, has a wide, uh, strong presence on the public. All the way upstairs once, I had to do it twice. Okay, Elsa keeps on unmuting herself. So let me see what I can do here. No, I just mute Elsa. Okay. Peggy, you're safe. Okay. I can, I, can, I can mute people individually, I can see. Should I continue? No, I just want to say that, that since. Uh, since this talk and, the, and Chabad has promoted the correct design, uh, shape of the menorah, it's, it's becoming more and more popular. But before this time, the menorah was, was, was depicted, um, certainly the, the symbol of the state of Israel, the, uh, the Knesset, the menorah. Also keeps on uh, amusing yourself there. Um, I'm oh, sorry, it's on uh, the 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 menorah was always but uh, uh, the menorah was always um, I'm, saying, I'm, I'm very tired and uh, it's escaping me. But the the menorah was always promoted and having round round branches. And that's the subject of this talk. 
That's a mistake. Uh, it isn't. And as I said, uh, uh, synagogues uh, on, on, the, on the parochas, meaning the art cover and on, on the Torah mantles, and in general, the menorah has mistakenly for 2,000 years, by and large, been uh, shown as having round or oblong branches. It's not the case. So already we see here from Rashi, the classic commentary, who says black and white, they extended upward in a diagonal, no indication that they were rounded. Moreover, we just read that the very words that Torah implies in referring to the seven or the six branches that extend from the center shaft, the term is kinin, which implies a reed, a straight line. So where does this round business come from? Continue reading, please. Thank you. Part of the confusion concerning the shape of the branches of the menorah stems from the fact that the Rambam makes no definite statement regarding this issue, neither in his commentary on the Mishnah nor in his Mishnah Torah. For that reason, several commentaries were led to the conclusion that he also agrees that the branches were semicircular. So, Nothing, what, you know, why? Because since the Rambam doesn't say they were straight, leaving it open, and the Rambam is, the, is as we learned this morning's class, he is the, uh, especially when it comes to these laws, the laws of the temple, he's uh, not the final word, he's the, he's the uh, authoritative word, authoritative word on Jewish law in general, but particularly the Beis Amigdash, since he leaves it open, so some have mistakenly said, he doesn't say it straight. So then it's, you can read into it and interpret, or it's not really interpreting, it's just because it's open. You, uh, some wanted to say that he says that they can be round. So the Rebbe continues, go on, nothing, Nothing, however, could be further from the truth. The Rambam does not describe the shape of the branches of the menorah because it is unnecessary. Yeah. In both his commentary on the Mishnah and his Mishnah Torah, he adds drawings in which he depicts the menorah. Okay, so just to say, he wrote a commentary on the Talmud. It's called Commentary on the Mishnah. And he also wrote the Mishnah Torah, which is the codification of all the Jewish law. And he... Fascinatingly, he actually adds his own drawings and diagrams. Continue. And in both instances, he shows the branches as extending diagonally in straight lines. Unfortunately, at the time the Rambam wrote these works, printing presses had not been invented. It was not until several centuries after his passing that his texts were printed. And in these printings, his original drawings were omitted. Okay, there's a commentary. I, I, don't, I don't know if you have it. Do you have diagrams in your text? Yes. So you can see there, that's, that's a, they don't show you the original, the original picture of the Rambam. I don't know what you have. I don't have the original. It would be nicer and more uh, appropriate for the publishers of book we're reading to actually photocopy, a photocopy of the Rambam's original drawing. Actually, I do have it. In another work, let me show it to you. He, it's interesting because he seems like he made it with this stamp. I'm pretty sure it's the back here, yeah. You bear with me a second, I'm, I'm trying to find it. Like he made kind of stamps. See what I mean when you look at it. I'm pretty sure I saw it here. And you want to find something? Murphy's Law. You're not going to go. Oh, here we go. This actually is a photocopy of the original manuscript of the, of the Ramba. And you can see that they are diagonal. Now, we're going to talk about the other designs on the menorah in a moment. But what you can see, if you, and if you can see that there, there are, oh, the Torah is very specific. There are round shapes, the Torah calls bulbs or flowers. And what you're looking at there is triangular shapes. You see triangle, triangular shapes and rounded shapes. 
the number of them and where they're placed in the menorah is, is specifically um, commanded in the Torah, in scripture itself. But we'll talk about that in a moment. That's actually from the Ram's original manuscript. Now, when they published the, the, the printing presses were invented, um, whenever they decided not to, or just didn't consider it significant to publish for the reader, the, the, the original uh, diagram and that would have clarified it for everyone. So let's continue. Equally clear evidence of the Rambam's perspective can be gleaned from the commentary to the Torah written by his son, Rabbeinu Avraham. When describing the manner in which the menorah was fashioned, Rabbeinu Avraham states, the six branches extended upward from the center shaft of the menorah in a straight line as depicted by my father and not in a semicircle as depicted by others. So Rabbeinu Avraham lays the matter to rest and that it was straight. And there's a footnote five. I don't know if you see it. From the end of your text, you have it. Mm -hmm. You can read it for us. The irony of this. The irony of this is compounded by the fact that drawings were added in subsequent printings of the commentary on the Mishnah. These drawings, however, were not copies of the drawings originally made by the Rambam, but rather original works produced for this printing. The texts with these drawings have been reprinted very frequently and are included in the standard printed texts of the Talmud. In regard to the branches of the menorah, and similarly in regard to certain other drawings throughout the work, the drawings in these texts run contrary to the Rambam's own work. So the Rebbe is bemoaning the fact, kind of, that they, in subsequent uh, uh, printings, they, they put in drawings, but their own. And we're not faithful to the Rambam's own diagram that I showed you a, a photocopy of. So the Rebbe is out to correct this. Um, and, and it's wrong to, uh, uh, to uh, portray the menorah with the rounded branches. And again, uh, since the early 80s, when he spoke about this, uh, or, um, it's become popular for the menorah to be depicted correctly. Now, let's talk about the goblet. So thank you, Peggy. Uh, Robert, Robert Burke, would you be for us the position of the goblets? The position of the goblets. Another of the points of difference between the Rambam's conception of the menorah as reflected in the above mentioned diagrams and the commonly accepted design of the menorah is the position of the goblets. To explain, there were 22 goblets in the menorah. The Rambam describes them as Alexandrian chalices with wide mouths and narrow bases. In his drawings of the menorah, he depicts them as having been positioned upside down, while the general conception is that they are standing upright. So that's another very critical um, difference. In his own original drawing, look at it again. No, they look like they're triangles, but they're the goblets, and you see they're upside down. The narrow part is upper, and the wider part faces downwards. And all of the standard diagrams, they have the goblets in the reverse. Again, ignoring the way the Rambam himself depicts them. Now, it's obvious, you know, he, he doesn't give an exact uh, drawing of the goblet. They were, they were co like cone-shaped, you know, not pointed. Uh, at the, but it's, it's the general idea, and it's very clear that they're upside down. That much is very clear in his diagram. So what's the point? Let's continue. Continue, Robert. The source for the misconceptions. How did these misconceptions arise? The source for the commonly accepted drawings of the menorah is its depiction on the arch of Titus in Rome. When Titus returned from the conquest of Jerusalem, he had an arch constructed in honor of his victorious army. And on that arch appears a relief which includes a depiction of the menorah. So it has, uh, people are carrying this big menorah. I don't know if it's, the Romans carrying it off in booty, yeah, the Romans. 
maybe the captive Jews. I don't remember that someone can look it up in, as we're talking. You'll see a picture. It's a famous, it's, in, it's there in Rome till this day. And that menorah is round, has rounded branches. And it's completely, forget the Ramba, all of the other details that the Torah describes about the menorah are not there. So the menorah they're showing is not an accurate depiction of the menorah of the, of the holy temple. There were other menorahs that may have been round that were used for purposes of illumination or whatever. The artist was told it was a seven branch menorah. He never saw it himself and he made what he thought the menorah looked like. But in every detail of it, it's nothing like anybody. The scripture, nothing like the scriptural description. For example, the knobs and the, the, the chalices, nothing. And there's all kinds of ornaments, but nothing reflective of the original. So continue, and that's become the source because it's round, that became the source of the way Jews um, would depict the menorah. It's 2000 years old, right? The design on that arch. Uh, it was an Italian designer. That's why everybody loves Italian design. <laughs> there you go. The design of that on that arch is obviously an artist's interpretation and not an exact replica of the menorah of the base had Mignesh. This is reflected by the fact that certain elements of the menorah are omitted in this depiction. For example, the menorah had feet extending from its base. The Torah says it has to have three legs. And the menorah... And the menorah on the arch of Titus has no feet. Similarly, the depiction contains additions, for on its shaft is the form of a sea dragon one of the false deities worshiped by the Romans. Accordingly, it cannot be relied on as an accurate source regarding the design of the, the menorah, particularly in regard to points where it contradicts the views of our people's leading Torah authorities. Herein lies another significant point. As mentioned, the menorah is often employed as a Jewish symbol. This is indeed appropriate for our sages teach that the menorah is testimony to all the inhabitants of the world that the divine presence rests within Israel. Stop for a second. Why? How's a testimony? Because the westernmost light, the westernmost light of the menorah, closest to the Holy of Holies, burned continuously. There was enough oil. That was like the Hanukkah story uh, every day. This is during the first temple. The miracle didn't continue in the second, but for hundreds of years, for more than hundreds. The time of Moshe Rabbeinu until the destruction of the first Beis which is still stood 500 years, and that so it's 900, maybe close to a thousand years, to 900 and a thousand years, the westernmost light, although there was only enough oil to burn for the night, but all the burned all the way till the next lighting, the next afternoon. So therefore it was, it was a, uh, as he says here, testimony to all the inhabitants of the world that the divine presence rests within Israel. Another detail, maybe he's gonna mention this. Ah, it's gonna come out. All right, so let's continue. How unfitting is it that the, instead of drawing that symbol according to its conception by Torah sages, the conception from the arch which proudly states Judea is vanquished, is used instead. Judea capitula, whatever the, the Roman term, is, more or less. And that's what's inscribed on the, on the Arch of Titus. And that's where we're getting as Jews the, that the symbol of the menorah and, and its depiction and, and its, its design and shape. So that's why the Rebbe felt it's so important to rectify this. We should not be using as a symbol in Judaism symbol that the divine presence rests amongst the Jewish people, the false depiction made by a Roman artist, by the Romans who destroyed the temple and emblazoned on the arch, the defeat of Judea. It's time to reclaim the, the authentic Jewish Torah um, depiction of the menorah with its straight branches. Okay, let's continue. By the way, as some of you may remember, hmm, looking at who's here, I don't know. 
Um, but the first, I mean, it was the first time, one of the first times that uh, Um, sorry. Well, okay, it'll come to me in a minute, I'll share with you. Okay, let's continue the text. Um, the outpouring of divine light. Thank you, Robert. Um, Ethan, please, the outpouring of divine light. To return to the design of the menorah, one might ask, why are the goblets indeed positioned upside down? The resolution of this question is connected with the function of the menorah within the Beis Hamikdash. Our sages explain that the purpose of the menorah was not to illuminate the sanctuary, but rather to spread its light throughout the entire world. For this purpose, the windows of the Beis Hamikdash were constructed in a unique manner wide on the outside, narrow on the inside, clearly indicating that their purpose was for the light of the Beis HaMikdash to shine outward. Let me explain what, is, what he means by wide on the outside, narrow on the inside. The walls, I don't think there were any glass. The walls, the windows were simply openings in the very thick Jerusalem stone. Now, the ordinary, common purpose of a window is to bring light in. So it's, it's narrow on the outside and wide on the inside to diffuse the light inwards, like a porthole on a ship. If you've ever been on a ship, on a cruise, I'm sure they still uh, still designed this way, that the openings on the outside are narrower than the inside where the light diffuses inside the room. But that's the objective of the window. But in the, in the base of Migdash, it was the reverse. It was narrow on the inside, a narrow opening, and then carved out into the, in the brick, the outside was wider. And this is the reason, because it's very symbolic, that the purpose of the base of Migdash is to illuminate the world. In the words of our sages, does God need the light of the menorah? It doesn't need its light. We do, the world does. So the base of Migdash from out of Zion goes forth Torah, Kibbutzian, Tetzi Torah, from Jerusalem, the Holy Temple, light, holiness, sanctity, is to spread and illuminate the world. So consistent with that, now we'll understand why the goblets are upside down. Go ahead, continue. A similar concept applies in regard to a goblet. It possesses two functions, to receive and to pour. Turning a goblet upside down indicates an emphasis on spreading influence to others. To apply these concepts to the goblets of the menorah, their overturned position reflects the purpose of the menorah within the base Hamikdash, not to receive and contain godly light, but to spread that light throughout the world at large. Right, so that's the reason. The reason that the goblets, the chalices, are upside down because they're symbolic of the purpose of the Mishkan, is to pour light to the world and moreover, an overturned cup is associated with happiness. As in bottoms up, um, there was a famous Fabrengen in 1988. I wasn't there. I was already uh, I was already here in, in my actually somebody in those days, but we all heard about it. It's most unusual that the Fabrengen Simchas Torah of 1988. Uh, in a very unusual instruction, believe it or not, and I'm going to tell you now, is not common at all. It happened once, maybe twice. So the Rebbe said, but not like this, the Rebbe said, um, I should say, Lachaim, and drain the cups, and moreover, turn the cups upside down, which he did himself. He finished his cup of wine, and he turned this Kiddush cup upside down, and I was, they were singing, he was waving with his, I think, wasn't there, waving, holding the cup upside down and waving and encouraging the singing. So an upside down cup, you know, is, your, is symbolic of, of joy. You've obviously you've drunk all the wine and you're, it's empty and you're celebrating. So it's very, very symbolic and very powerful of an unbridled joy um, that we, the Jewish people, have to inspire and share with the world. 
just as a note, it's interesting because in China, when you have a big table and you 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 do bottoms up, that's what they do at the end. Also, they turn the cups upside down and, and put go. them on the table. Yeah, this was the only time this ever happened. This this uh, I mean, that was once before, many years earlier. There was, there was an instruction: say lachaim and full cup, empty it. But to turn it upside down, that was that was that unusual simcha story night. And they say the simcha was like really uh, beyond anything they'd ever seen before. And friends, you, I'm not exaggerating. Um, when Sheikh will come, you'll see it, but the kind of simcha we saw in 770, simcha Torah by the Rebbe just defies imagination and description. Uh, and that night at the Fabrenian with the upside down cup and the Rebbe's waving the cup like this and, and the, the joy is just bursting through uh, all limits uh, all associated with the upside down cup. So the root of it is the menorah, the upside down cups of the menorah. So that's consistent with the whole function of the menorah, which is to radiate light outwards. Conclude. This also relates to the Beis HaMikdash, which served as the source of happiness and joy for the Jewish people. May we soon experience the ultimate happiness when we, together with the entire Jewish people, return to Eretz Israel to Jerusalem and to the Beis HaMikdash, and may this take place in the immediate future. Amen. Amen. So I just remembered what I was trying to tell you. Um, a very beloved, colorful figure in the MTC for many years was Mr. Chaim Rosen. Of blessed memory, some of you may remember him. David Midgey had brought him to the MTC. Now, Chaim Rosen was the most unusual man. He was self-taught, highly educated, erudite, articulate, and knowledgeable. And he was, he had enlisted, volunteered for the, what do they call it? The Jewish Corps of the British Army. Had, well, I think it was called the Jewish Corps, had a, a name, and they served in North Africa. And they were recruited from Jews living in Palestine under British rule. And this is World War II. So he was part of that battalion, the Jewish Corps, the Jewish battalion. The Chaim's Rosen story is, and we became very close friends, I should tell you. And I, I, I treasure, I have gifts that he gave me, books, that he inscribed and uh, some pottery, archeological discovery, ancient pottery of, of Israel that he had in his possession that he gave me in a coin, another occasion that he gave to me and for our children. And we had the great merit of Chaim Rosen gracing our Seder tables for the last years in his life and our, our Friday night tables often. Now Chaim, I was very angry at God. Justifiably, he lost everybody in the Holocaust, his entire family. Parents, siblings, and all his extended family. As you heard, he had emigrated to Israel before. So he lived in Palestine. But his family back in, uh, in Poland they were all exterminated. Chaim was a scholar, not, not as in general, of, of, of uh, Talmud and of general studies, history, particularly history, but in general. And uh, he didn't step foot in the show after the Holocaust. But David, befriended him, I lived in the David Michikovsky, David Michi, befriended him, and uh, he wasn't well. At some time he had uh, a health issue, and uh, David asked me to come and see him. Anyway, I did. He agreed to meet with me. And there was a chemistry, and the friendship began and blossomed for the years which followed.
So I'm gonna, why I'm reminded, I'll tell you in a moment, I'll get my final thing I share with you, but I'll, in his, in his merit, he, he, he didn't have children. Second marriage, he never had children, not from the first or the second. And we keep his yard site every year faithfully. We have some books here in the MTC that he donated, the set of Rambam, which we're learning Sunday morning, um, a beautiful set that he, he donated. So at one point, he, he uh, had a heart, uh, a heart attack. And he thought he survived to thank God a number of years, after, uh, lived a number of years after that. But he thought that this was his end. He was already then in his 80s. And I remember when I went to visit him in the hospital, he said to me, it was incredible. He said he hopes. I, I, no, he, I, no. He doesn't even hope. He doesn't, he does not even have the, I think he said even the word chutzpah, to expect that Hashem has accepted his teshuvah. But, not a but, he has, and if Hashem will accept it, this is an act of Hashem's grace, his teshuvah. Start to put on film and on his level, keep Shabbos. So I'm reminded of him because this is back in the old MTC before, way before he moved here. Before he built this uh, building here in the Cary Square. One of his first visits, he described how as a soldier, they were in Italy, they, they served in North Africa, the Jewish battalion served in North Africa. And under, under uh, and Rommel was defeated. And so they came to, to Rome. And he said he stood there by the Arch of Titus, which we just quoted here. That's where the whole mistake comes from, the depiction of the menorah, where it's written. That's why I know the words from him. Judea Capit, uh, whatever, Capitula Cap. Judea is being conquered, vanquished, conquered. And I wish I could say it in the words that he did, but I can't. I don't recall the words precisely. And he had a very endearing German accent because he's, he's, he's born in Poland, but his parents moved to Germany. His father was a teacher in Heide, in, the, in, a, in a, not Berlin, another city in Germany. I can't remember. Anyway, he had a very, a very interesting accent. But as he stood there, he says, my standing there was a living symbol. Our, our group, our Jewish soldiers, of the eternity of the Jewish people, who is capitulating? Us, the Romans, are a footnote in history. And we are here. And Nazi Germany will also, the war wasn't over yet. Maybe just over. Nazi Germany yeah, was over. Nazi Germany is also de defeated. And Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people are here alive and eternal. It was, for those that were there, it was a, a moment never to be forgotten. Chaim Rosen describing standing there, the Arch of Titus, symbolic of the eternity of the Jewish people. On the, not really on the ashes, ashes still smoldering in Auschwitz. I'm Yisrael Chaim. So I share these words with you. May this be a, uh, it certainly is because you're all listening and inspired. Uh, Nachas for him. He was a very dear friend, a very special, special person. And in his place on high, as we are quoting him and learning from his Rambam, which I did earlier, um, this is certainly a Nachas to his soul, a Nachas to Michael, who was also a very good friend of his. Michael's a good friend of everybody. Uh, so this year is dedicated to, to Michael, Modchidov, and Pesach Halevi. We know that he has nachas from our coming together each Sunday. Inspired by him, dedicated to him, and may we merit that we are united, reunited to all our loved ones, Chaim, Michael, and all our loved ones here in this world. I didn't see uh, with Mashiach's coming without delay on me. Amen. I didn't see Amen. the latest news from out of Surfside, but 
fact I didn't hear anything means there's no no good news. What can I say? Hashem has to transform all of this and bring the redemption and have us all reunited. So that the three weeks that we are mourning become three weeks of celebration. Tisha B'Av this year, not a fast day, but the happiest day. And friends, let's remember when Mashiach comes now before Tisha B'Av, Let's remember, we're all gonna say Lachai, but let's make a little pact amongst ourselves now. Mm-hmm. The Mashiach comes, we're gonna say Lachaim, we're gonna finish the cup, and we're gonna hold it in our hands and dance with it upside down. A deal. Yeah. Amen. May we experience that. Amen without delay. Thanks yeah. all for joining and have everybody a wonderful week. And thank you to our wonderful readers and all of you that joined us today. Rabbi Neil. Rabbi, yes. when, did, when did the Chaim Rosen die? He said he passed away. I'll tell you exactly when. Oh, no, no, sorry. No, I don't have it. I, I could look it up, but now this is the Rambam that he gave, but he gave it inscribed during his lifetime. He put it in. Chaim Rosen. Rosen. If you want, I can tell you actually when. I just mean, was it how many, like a years ago or? Yeah, yeah, but if you want to just wait a second. 